trust you are treated royally today. I don't know what you do in Chester, especially during a coronavirus situation. It's not like you can run to a local restaurant, probably, but... We find them. <laughs> you, you do you? Okay, good. Uh, but spoil mom, treat her right. Uh, it's just special. In our home, we celebrated it yesterday because we'd be here today, and so we had Corlin's parents over, and unfortunately, you got stuck in the kitchen for a lot of it. But uh, we had our daughter and son-in-law with us, and our daughter is going to have a baby in a month, so that's all exciting and, and uh, new and everything. So we had a we had a fun day. Appreciate your mom, uh, whether she whether you still have her with you or whether you uh, view her every day working hard. You you may have heard this uh, kind of silly little story. A father was trying to explain the concept of marriage to his four-year-old daughter, okay? So here's dad trying to explain marriage to a four-year-old girl. So he got out the wedding album thinking visual images would help, and he explained uh, the entire wedding service to his daughter. And when he was finished, he asked her if she had any questions. And she pointed to a picture of the wedding party and she said, Daddy, is that when Mommy came to work for us? And, uh, that's about it, isn't it? Uh, I'll tell you what, you moms are just incredible. You uh, carry such a load. And so oftentimes, I know carry the management of the home as well. So thank you, thank you for doing that. I've pastored long enough, too, to know that um, for some, this is a difficult day. Some ladies have wanted to be a mother, but for some reason, perhaps haven't been able to yet. Some, uh, some of you at one time may have lost a child. How difficult that is. Some of you may have a wayward child. Maybe you're not even sure where they are today. It's so hard. Perhaps you're here this morning and you're raising children alone. Single mom, I expect. They deserve uh, a huge medal and more. Maybe you're here and uh, Mother's Day for you is just hard because maybe your mother wasn't a good mom. And you're still struggling with that issue. Some may have lost their mother to death, perhaps even recently, and uh, today you just you just miss them. I, my mother passed away 13 years ago, but you know, I'll bet there's hardly a day that goes by that I don't think of her in some way, you know, just some remembrance of her. I remember for the first year, year or so after she died, I would always call her, first of all, every week to check on her. And do you know, I can't tell you the times I thought, I'm going to tell mom, whoop, can't do that anymore. And some of you know what that's like. So um, I just say, mom, you're so special to us, and we thank God for you. Motherhood in the Bible, as I said during our prayer, t prayer time, is such a strong illustration of God's love. I'm convinced there's no earthly love as strong as a mother's love. Oh, I know, I'm ta not talking about God's love for us, but I'm talking about relationship among us. I think mom's uh, is the strongest. Now, dads, I'm not discrediting us. We love our kids dearly. Oh, my three children, they're so near and dear to my heart. I just love them. But th I believe there's a mysterious bond between a mother and child. Yeah. That, that dads, you and I don't quite grasp. We almost do, but we don't quite. Um, <clears throat> mother and child spent nine months together as she carried that child in the womb. And I, I believe a spiritual bond happened during that time that cannot quite be du duplicated in the same way. Again, dads, we love our kids. I'm not, 
I'm not saying that we don't, but we had our children, of course, in the day of mamas, and so I was in the room when they were born, and, and uh, I even got the, cut the cord on two out of three of them. <laughs> and it, it was such a special time, but you know, when that baby came out, and they grabbed it, and we cut the cord, and they kind of patted it down with a blanket and so on, cleaned it up a little bit, but then they handed it to Corlin. And I'll never forget that. Just for a moment, as she stared at that little one that she carried, and I remember her saying, oh baby, oh baby. And you know what? For about a half a second, I felt awkward. I felt like a, an intruder. Now I... Of course I was a dad, I mean, this is my flesh and blood too, but for just a moment I thought, whoa, this is a holy moment. As two people who had been around one another for nine months, but looked at one another for the first time. It's just, it's just something special, and I think there's just a, such a special, special bond there. Special bond between moms and children. Um, you know, loving moms will go to almost any length for their child. I think of some bib biblical examples. Um, Moses' mother, and she, they were going to destroy babies. She hid him in a basket. I mean, she was willing to go to any length to protect that child. How about the two moms who appeared before Solomon, arguing over a baby? And Solomon said, all right, get me a sorrel. Cut that baby in half, we'll give you each half. And of course the real mom said, no, 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 no. She wasn't going to see that child destroyed at all. And of course that identified who the real mother was. And then don't you love James and John's mother? She's a typical mom. This is my paraphrase. She said, Jesus, those other guys that follow, follow you, they're, they're good men, but my boys, <laughs> Jimmy and Johnny, <laughs> you know, they're really special. Couldn't you let one sit on their right, and, or on your right, and one on your left when you come in here? Because, you know, they're my boys. <laughs> It's not coming through. Okay. We'll try this one, guys. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. We there? Or is it back here? Sorry, folks. We'll get there. All right. Check, check. Yeah, you know, James and John, the mother, they just, she just, she was convinced they were so special. And every mom feels that way, don't they? These are our kids. They're the best. My mother used to go on and on about me, and of course, Corlin, she knows me. <laughs> she knows I'm not that good. <laughs> Mom would be bragging about me, and Corlin would roll her eyes. <laughs> She'd say later, your mother thinks you're perfect. I said, hey, nobody knows you like your mother. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's true. Moms sometimes go a little overboard. Um, I, I heard an interview just this week of a man who'd been incarcerated 30 years, was finally released. You know who he talked about? His mother. He said, she's the only one who stayed by me, believed in me, because he was incarcerated wrongly. Mm -hmm. And she says, or he said, you know who was waiting at the prison door when I got out? Mom. <laughs> she hung in there with him, and that, doesn't that sound like a mom? Mm -hmm. Well, moms, you're just special, and I want to encourage and bless you in every way today. I'd like you to turn to uh, 2 Timothy, 
We're going to be looking at 2 Timothy, just a couple of passages, and then also one in Acts 16. But turn to 2 Timothy, first of all. And I'll refer to this in a moment. But Timothy is such an example of a godly man who was greatly influenced by his mother and his grandmother. Isn't it interesting how family lines are so important? Um, scholars feel that Timothy was a boy raised in a home where the women served God, but his father evidently, what little we know about it, he, he didn't seem to be that interested in spiritual things. Um, grandma is mentioned, godly woman. Mom is mentioned. But the only thing that is said about his dad is that he was a Greek. That's all we know. But notice chapter 1 of 2 Timothy and verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5, it says, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Okay? Lord, we do just pray for your blessing on your word and on our time together today in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, notice that, uh, number one, Timothy was taught a sincere faith in his childhood home. So important, a sincere faith. Uh, we're told that his grandmother, grandmother Lois had this sincere faith, that it was passed on to Mother Eunice, and now it lived in Timothy also, a sincere faith. I love how faith can get handed down through the generations. I'm not saying that children be automatically become Christians or Christ followers. Uh, no, of course, it's a personal decision we all make. But there's an influence of a family. There's an influence of a faith line, if you would. Uh, notice it was a sincere faith. And the, the term Paul uses in this letter is no hypocrisy. That's what sincere means. In other words, these women who were greatly influencing his life were not one thing when they were around church people and another thing when they got home and nobody saw what they were doing. Uh, they didn't befriend people at church and talk about them behind their back at home. Um, the old term we used to use is they didn't have roast preacher for dinner. <laughs> no, they were sincere in their faith. In other words, they lived it without hypocrisy. I'm convinced that a healthy home is probably the best discipleship tool there is in the world. Now, I know not everybody's uh, been privileged to have that. I understand that. But you want your children to grow up to love and serve God with their whole hearts. Of course, we all do. And I just challenge you, make sure your home is spiritually healthy. Uh, I didn't say perfect. Those homes don't exist but I'm talking about a sincere faith, no hypocrisy, a sincere love for God, love for one another. When problems arise, which they always do, work through it with tenderness and love, but have that sincere faith, no hypocrisy before the children. Uh, Timothy lived in a home that was like that, where grandma and mom were sincere in their faith and as he saw that model, it so, so impacted his life. He saw a model at home. Secondly, notice this. Timothy was taught a deep love for Scripture. A deep love for the Bible or Scripture as they knew it. Uh, turn over to 2 Timothy for a moment. Uh, excuse me, chapter 3 of 2 Timothy and verses 14 and 15. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Paul writes again, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have 
known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Notice a couple of things here. In verse 14, Paul urges Timothy to continue in the things he has learned and become convinced of. And then in verse 15, Paul refers to him knowing scripture from infancy. <laughs> Did you catch that? They're teaching an infant scripture. I believe, I, I'm a firm believer that expectant parents ought to talk to that baby while it's in the womb. <laughs> we did it with our children. Um, it's, it's just, this, this child is hearing things, you know, <laughs> even in the womb. And of course, praying for them. We prayed for those children in the womb and uh, prayed for their future spouses. And I mean, we just covered the bases because just uh, believe it was uh, so important. But uh, I love the fact that here they were teaching Timothy scripture from infancy. Uh, we read the word of God to our children when they were very, very young. Of course, we did it at uh, scripture. We used scripture that they could understand at that age. Um, you know, little children, of course, it'd be a little tough for them to understand, to catch uh, scripture that we read as adults. But how many of you have ever heard of Dan Betzer and Dan and Louie? Mm -hmm. Okay? A talented man in many, many ways. Uh, preached for Revival Time radio program for years. But anyway, he did a, he did a Dan and Louie. Louie was a ventriloquist dummy. And Dan, of course, did this ventriloquist act, but he recorded stories. And uh, when our son, who is now 35, when he was just young, we had some dear friends in our lives uh, who became like grandparents to our children. They didn't have grandchildren of their own, but they became like our kids' grandkids. And so one year at Bible camp, they bought a set of Dan and Louie tapes. Remember what a cassette tape is? <laughs> <laughs> They're long gone. But anyway, back in those days, that's what we had. So they bought this set for us. And folks, it was the greatest thing they could have ever given our kids. <laughs> Every night, we put these kids to bed with a Dan and Louie tape running. And pretty soon, of course, they got where they insisted on a Dan and Louie tape running. And they were Bible stories, but friends, they're funny. <laughs> I remember we'd be sometimes maybe in a motel room with the children. We're all, you know, in one room. Well, the kids had to have Dan Louie running to get to sleep. So we'd all be laying there listening to Dan Louie. And some of the humor was puns and things that only a, an adult would catch. So Corbin and I are laying there trying to get to sleep, and pretty soon we're chuckling and, you know, trying. I mean, it's just crazy. But these were the greatest investment. Uh, I remember Sunday school teachers coming to us and saying, wow, we're impressed. You guys must really teach your children the Bible. I said, well, <laughs> it's Dan and Louie. <laughs> I, you know, friends, it sounds like I'm doing an, an advertisement for them, but I think you can still get them out online. I think you can, you know, Google Dan and Louie and maybe just download them or whatever. I don't know, but I think they're still available. They're, the, they're a great resource. They just really are. Uh, yeah. Corlin homeschooled our children in the early years, and the Bible was such a strong part of the curriculum. Just to, uh, you know, yeah, it just it's just so important to get scripture into our children and then into the word of God, <coughs> regularly reading it. Um, I I used to ask my children from time to time, I'd say, where, where, are you, where are you reading right now? Where are you reading in the word? Where are you reading in the Bible? And then, of course, friends, that brings us it back to us. They need to see us in it. They need to see us having the Bible and Scripture as a regular part of our day as well. So, Timothy learned it as an infant. That's what Scripture does. Makes us wise 
for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All right. All right, and then number three, I want you to notice uh, Timothy was taught ministry as a regular way of life. Turn over to Acts chapter 16 for a moment. Acts, the 16th chapter. And beginning at verse 1, again it's describing uh, Paul's missionary journey. It says, he came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. There's that reference. The, brethren at, the brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of Timothy. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey so the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Um, Timothy was taught ministry as a regular way of life. And of course, when I say ministry, you, you, you've heard me talk about this before. Every one of us in this room are ministers. We're not all pastors, but we're all ministers. We're all priests unto God. I've taught on that before. Uh, we're all to be involved in where this young man named Timothy lived. And uh, Paul was evidently looking for a traveling companion to help him in the work of the ministry. The brothers there spoke very well of this young man, and so Paul chose him to travel with him. What an honor that must have been, to travel with a guy like Paul who wrote half the New Testament, touching people for Christ, probably from grandma and mom. It was probably such a part of their home culture. Just as he came to faith in Christ, just as he learned a love for scripture, I believe that in his childhood home, he very likely learned ministry as a normal way of life. I, I challenge you, families, uh, moms and dads, encourage your children to learn ministry at an early age. And I... I sense, as I've been here now almost a year, I sense that's happening. I just watch some of you families, and I commend you for that, because I see that happening as you're teaching your children. Um, as I've pastored many years, one thing that used to confuse me about some families I encountered years ago is... <coughs> Some families seem very hesitant to have their children involved in church ministries. Now, most did. Most just got involved and so on. But there was always a family or two that they wouldn't let their children go to kids' church. No, nope, they had to keep them right on the, <coughs> on the chair beside them. They wouldn't let them get involved in youth group. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope, that's our family night at home. Well, you know, and I, I, I don't know all the details of that. Maybe they had reasons for that. I don't know. But... Um, it almost seemed like they viewed church as competition somehow to family. And, and I know maybe there are some areas where it has become, or I, I don't know, but uh, I just tell you the church is not in competition with your family. Um, teach your children the value of learning ministry and learning to minister to others as they, as they grow up. You know what? It can seem risky. Lois and Eunice had to be willing to let Timothy head out as a young man. And of course, that was in the day when somebody left for a few months. You didn't see him. You may not even hear from him for a long, long time. Unlike today where we have almost constant contact. But uh, he, they just headed it or sent him out to Paul to travel and learn missions work. Here's a tough question. Moms and dads, are you willing to let kids go if they're called? Are you willing to let them be out of your sight for long periods of time? 
We dedicated our children to the Lord, of course, when they were young babes. Our son was called into ministry, and uh, he has quite a testimony about all that. But several years ago, we were looking for a youth pastor, so I really felt like the Lord was leading me to him. And that's a whole story in itself. But I sat with Andrew one day, and we talked a lot about the details of it. I said, Andrew, I want you to give the church, as, as youth pastor, I want you to give them a five-year commitment. He said, let me think about that. <laughs> so I gave him a couple days, and he came back to me, and he said, I'll give you four. So I thought about that. I said, okay, four-year commitment. I said, why four? He said, because I'm going to the mission field. Oh. <laughs> hey, we dedicated them to the Lord. But man, the mission field. And then they went and had four kids and took them with them. <laughs> Those grandkids leaving a little tough. Now, I don't share that because we're such wonderful people and all that, but we did dedicate them to the Lord. We did say, here, Lord, you use them as you want to, and whatever that means. So I just ask you again, moms and dads, are you willing to let go of your kids so they can minister as unto the Lord? And, I, and I'm not saying they're going to be sent off to the mission field. You know that we don't know that. That's up to the Lord. But we do need to hold our children loosely. And that's what uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother did with Timothy. Of course, he was used mightily by God. Moms, I want to just tell you again, you are special. You're a gift. In closing, I want to share with you um, advice from a woman who raised 17 children. That's a few kids. Isn't it? Some of you only have four or five. <coughs> Think you're busy. This is Susanna Wesley, who, of course, was the mother of John and Charles Wesley. I think, well, it was in the early 1700s, so it was a few hundred years ago. Now, some of this sound, or, or, or excuse me, some of this will sound a little archaic, but uh, here's some of her advice. I'll get to it in a moment. Notice this. She had 17 children. Now, obviously, she didn't have 17 all at once, but she had 17 over a period of time. She spent one hour each day praying for her kids, okay? So when she eventually had 17, I, I figured that out, what's that, about three and a half minutes a kid <laughs> that you pray for them? But still, back then, when she only had five or six, it was more extended, I guess. But she spent one hour each day praying for children. And in addition, she took each child aside for a full hour each week to discuss spiritual matters. That's interesting, isn't it? Wow. 17 children and you're taking one hour with each child? Oh, that's a lot. But her two sons, John and Charles, went on to bring spiritual blessing to all of England and much of America. She invested in these children. Here are some of her parenting guidelines. Okay. Subdue self-will in a child and thus work together with God to save his soul. Boy, she must have had a firm hand. I like this. Teach the child to pray as soon as he can speak. I mean, she taught these kids. Here's a good one. Give the child nothing he cries for and only what is good for him if he asks for it politely. Have you ever heard somebody in the grocery store or something an aisle over and you just want to go, oh, Jesus, help them. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
Oh, we, none of us get it perfect, I know that, but there are, she gives some good advice here. Here's a few more. To prevent lying, punish no fault which is freely confessed, but never allow a rebellious, sinful act to go unnoticed. For a man. Commend and reward good behavior. Boy, I like that. I've heard it said today, catch them being good. And, and bless them for it. And then strictly observe all promises you have made to your child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So important. So important. That's great parenting advice from a mother who raised 17 children in another time. And she did so quite successfully. And of course, the two boys we know went on to really change much of their uh, culture that they were situated in. Courtney, why don't you come up to the piano? I just, I think I'll just have her come at this time, worship team. And um, moms, you make such an incredible impact on all of us, but especially, especially the lives of precious children. And I just want you to know again, we love you. We're so proud of you. So thankful for you. And uh, I want to I want to pray for you today. In years gone by, on Mother's Day, I'd always have the moms come up around the altar. I think I'll just have you stand where you are today, okay? So, moms, if you're a mom here today, would you simply stand where you are? I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. to receive this as it really is. It's just a blessing. Again, I want you to know we're so thankful for you. Thanks for all the work you put into us and the investment you make in a home. Lord, today in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these precious precious godly women. I pray strength for physical bodies right now. Some may just be weary. I just pray strength for their bodies. Some need healing today, Lord, in their physical bodies. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak healing into physical bodies. And Lord, I pray that these mothers would, you would just restore and renew them. I pray that they would have strong minds all of their life, that their actual brain, their mind would be strong, strong throughout all the days of their life. Lord, I pray for their children today. Some moms standing today may be wondering where their kids are spiritually or or maybe some are even wondering where they are physically but Lord I pray that you reach out and touch those kids today touch them mightily Lord I pray great provision physical provision for them I pray prosperity over them in every way God and Lord, in this uncertain time that our nation is in and our world is in, Lord, I pray your peace will just surround them in every way. And Lord, you know the desires of their hearts. Some of these dear moms have such deep desires in their hearts. They maybe haven't even shared it with anyone else, but Lord, I pray that as they follow after you, that you grant the desires of their hearts in every way. So Lord, I just give you praise over them. I give you thanks. I say bless them in every way. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand together. We close the service. I want us to honor the one who really this is all about, and that's Jesus. Let's declare it today. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. 